Uh, let's see. wait till the spring gets at them, and wait till the sun the rain, and the rain falls on the sunshine, and then they'll find out how I did Mary forgetting to be careful. Look along the twigs and branches, and if thou sees a bit of brown here and there, watch it after the rain, uh, the warm rain, and see what happens. And then look curiously at her eager face. Why does thou care so much about roses and such all of a sudden, he demanded. Mistress Mary felt her face grow red. She was almost afraid to answer. I say that, that I have a garden of my own, she stammered. I, there is nothing for me, nothing, and no one. Well, said Bed and Weatherstaff slowly as he watched her. True, that hasn't. He said it in such an odd way that Mary wondered if he was actually a little sorry for her. She had never felt sorry for herself. She had only felt cross because she disliked people and things so much. But now the world seemed to be changing and getting nice. If no one found out about the secret garden, she should enjoy herself always. She stayed with him for ten or fifteen minutes longer and asked him so many questions as she did. He answered every one of them in his queer, grunting way, and he did not seem really cross and did not pick me leave her. He said something about roses just as she was going away, and it reminded her he had seen uh, he had said he was had been fond of do you go to roses now she asked not been this year my rheumatics has made me to the joints she said it he said it in his grumbling voice and then quite seemed to get angry with her though she did not see why he should now look here he said sharp don't ask so many questions thou art the worst wench for asking questions i ever come Get thee gone and play thee. I've done talking for today. And he said it so crossly that there was not the least use in staying another minute. She went skipping slowly down the aisle, thinking him over, and saying to herself that queer as it was, here was another person, in spite of his crossness. He li she liked old Ben Weatherstaff. Yes, she She always wanted to try to make him talk to her. Also, she began to believe that he knew the world about flowers. There was a large laurel hedge walk which curved round the sun and ended at a gate which opened into the wood in a park. She thought she could skip round this walk and look into the wood and see if there were any rabbits popping about. She enjoyed the skipping very much, and when she reached the little gate, she opened it and went through. She heard a low, peculiar whistling sound and wanted to find out what it was very strange thing indeed she quite caught herself um, oh my goodness it was a very strange thing indeed she quite caught her breath as she stopped to look at it a boy was treated with his back against it playing on a rough wooden pipe he was a funny looking boy about twelve very clean and his nose turned up and his cheeks were as red as poppies and never had mistress mary seen such round and such blue eyes in any boy's face and on the track of the he leaned against, a brown squirrel was clinging and watching him, and from behind a bush, a bush near a hawk pheasant was delicately stretching his neck to peep out, and quite near him were two robins sniffing with trem tremulous noses. And actually it appeared as if they were drawing near to watch him and listen to the strange little low call his pipe seemed to make. When they saw Mary, he when he saw Mary, he held up his hand and spoke to her in a voice almost and rather like his piping. Don't thou move, he said. It Mary me remained motionless. He stopped playing his pipe and began to run. He moved so slowly that it scarcely, scarcely seemed as though he were moving at all, but it left his feet and then the squirrel scampered back up into the branches of his tree. The pheasant withdrew his head and the rock on all four and began to hop away, though not at all as if they were frightened. I'm, the boy said, I know thou art Miss Mary. Then Mary realized that somehow known at first that this was Dickon. Who else could have been charming rabbits and pheasants, natives charmed snakes in India? He was a wide red curve, he had a wide red mouth, and his smile spread all over his face. I got up slow, he explained, because if thou makes a quick move, it startles them. A body has to move gently, glow, and wild things is about. He did not speak to her as if they had seen each other before, but if he knew her quite well. 
Mary knew nothing about boys, and she spoke distinctly because she was felt rather shy. Did you get Martha's letter? she asked, with his curly, rust-colored head. That's why I come. He stopped to pick up something which had been laying on the ground beside him, and then he, and when he piped. About the garden tools, there's a little spade and rake and fork and a hoe. Hey, they have good There's a trowel, too. And the woman in the shop threw in a pack of white poppy and one of blue her when I bought the other seeds. Will you show me the seeds? Uh, will you show the seeds to me? It's quiet, uh, quick and easy. Oh, goodness. Will you show the seeds to me, Mary? She wished she could talk as he did. His speech was so quick and easy. It sounded as if he was not the least afraid she would not like him. Though he was only a common moor boy patched clothes and with a funny face and a round, rusty red head. Closer, as she came closer to him, she noticed that there was a clean, fresh scent of heather and grass in him, almost as if he were made of them. She liked it very much, and when she looked into his funny red cheeks and round blue eyes, she forgot that she had felt shy. Let us sit down on this log and look at them, she said. He sat down and took a little brown pack, paper package out of his coat, coat pocket. He untied the string, and inside there were ever so many neater and smaller packages with a picture of a flower on each one. A lot of mignonette and poppies, he said. Mignonette's the sweetest smell grows, and it'll grow whenever you, wherever you cast it, same as poppies will. The mouths will come up and bloom if you just whistle at them. It's the nicest of all. He stopped and turned his head quickly, his poppy-cheeked face lighting up. Where's that robin as is calling us, he said. The chirp came from a thick holly bush with scarlet berries, and Mary thought she knew whose it was. Is it really calling us, she said, said Dickon, as if it was the most natural thing in the world. He's calling someone he with. That's what he's saying. Here I am. Look at me. I want a bit of a chat. And here he's in the bush. Who is he? He's been Weatherstaff's, but I think he knows me a little, answered Mary. See, said Dickon in his low voice again, and he likes thee. He took thee on. He'll tell me all about thee in a minute. He moved quite close to the bush with the slow Mary had noticed before, and then he made a sound almost like the robin's own twitter. The robin listened intently, and then answered back as if he were replying to a question. I'm yours, chuckled Dickon. Do you think he is? cried Mary eagerly. She did so want to know. Do you think he really likes me? He wouldn't come near thee if he didn't, answered Dickon. Birds is rare than Robin can flout a body worse than a man. See, he's making up to thee now. And up there see a chap, he's saying. And it really seemed as if he must, it must be. He's so sidled and twittered and tilted as he hopped on his bush. Do you ever think birds say? said Mary. Dickens' grin spread until he seemed all wide, red mouth, and he rubbed his rough head. I think I do, and I think I do, and they think I do, he said. I've lived out on the moor with him so long. I've watched him break shell and come out and fledge and, and begin to sing till I think I'm one of them. Sometimes a big bird or a fox or a rabbit or a squirrel or even a beetle, and I don't know it. He laughed, he laughed and came back to the log and began to talk about the flower seeds again. He told her that, uh, what they looked like when they were flowers. He told her how to plant them and watch them and feed them. See here, he said suddenly, turning round to look at her. I'll plant them for the Where is the garden? Mary's thin hands clutched each other as they lay on her lap. I don't know what to say. So for a whole minute, she said nothing. She had never thought of it. She felt miserable. Then she felt as if she went red and then pale. That's got a bit of Dickon said. It was true that she had turned red and then pale. I saw her do it, and as she still said nothing, he began to be puzzled. I give thee a bit, he said. Has not got any yet? She held her hands tighter and her uh, eyes toward him. I don't know anything about boys, she said slowly. Could you keep up I told you one? It's a great secret. I don't know what I should do if anyone found it out. I shall die, she said the last sentence quite fiercely. Dickon looked more than ever and even rubbed his head over his rough 
a hand over his rough head again, quite good humoredly. I'm keeping secrets all the time, he said. I thought I couldn't keep secrets from the others about foxes, cubs, and birds' nests, and wild things' holes. Well, they say from the more. I, I can keep secrets. Mistress Mary did not mean to put out her touch's sleeve, but she did. I've stolen a garden, she said very fast. It isn't anybody's. Nobody wants it. Nobody cares for it. Nobody even goes into it. Perhaps everything already, I don't know. She began to feel hot and as contrary as she ever had in life. I don't care. I don't care. Nobody has got a right to take it from me when I care about it. And they, they're letting it die. All shut up by itself, she ended passionately, and she threw her face and burst out crying. Poor little Mistress Mary. Dickens' blue eyes grew rounder and rounder. Hey, he said, drawing his exclamation. And the way he did it meant both wonder and sympathy. I have nothing to do. Something belongs to me. I found it myself, and I got into it myself. And I was only just like the robin. Take it from the robin. Where is it? asked Dick in a drop. Mistress Mary got up from the log at once. She knew she felt contrary and obstinate near it all. She was imperious and Indian, and at the same time hot and sorrowful. I'll show you, she said. She led him round the laurel path into the walk where the ivy grew so Dickon followed her with a queer, almost pitying look on his face. He felt as if he were being led to look at some strange bird's nest and must move softly. When she wall and lifted the hanging ivy, he started. There was a door, and Mary pushed it open, and they passed it in together. And when Mary stood and waved her hand round defiantly, this, she said, it's a secret garden, and I'm the only one in the world who wants it to be alive. Dickon looked round and round about it, and round and round again. Eh, hey, he whispered, it is a queer, pretty place. It's like as if a body was in a Chapter 11. The Nest of the Mystery For two or three minutes he stood looking round him, while Mary watched him began to walk about softly, even more lightly than Mary had walked the first time she had found her four walls. His eyes seemed to be taking in everything, the gray trees with the grizz climbing over them and hanging from their branches, the tangle on the walls and among the grass, evergreen alcoves with the stone seats and the tall flowers, that flower urn standing in. I never thought I'd see this place, he said at last in a whisper. Did you know about it? She had spoken aloud, and he made a sign to her. We must talk low, he said, or someone will hear us and wonder what it, uh, what's to do in here. Oh, I forgot, being frightened and putting her hand quickly against her mouth. Did you know about the garden? She asked if she had recovered herself. Dickon nodded. Martha told him, uh, told us no one ever went inside, he answered. Us used to wonder what it was like. He stopped and looked round at the lovely gray tangle about him, and his round eyes looked great. Eh, the nest will be here come springtime, he said. It'll be the safest place in England. No one never come in near and tangles a tree and roses to build in. Wonder all the birds and the moor don't build here. Mary put her hand on his arm again without knowing it. Will there be roses? She whispered to tell. I thought perhaps they'd all be dead. Eh, no, not them. Not all of them. Here. He stepped over to the nearest tree, an old, old one with gray lichen all over, but upholding a curtain of tangled sprays and branches. He took a thick knife and opened one of its blades. There's lots of dead wood as ought to be cut out, he said. And there's a lot of old wood, but it's made some new last year. There, uh, This here is a big bit. He touched a shoot, which looked brownish green instead of gray, hard, dark gray. Mary touched it herself in an eager, reverent way. That one, she said. Is that one quite alive? Quite? Dickon curved his wide, smiling it's as wick as you or me, he said, and Mary remembered that Martha had told her that wick were lively. I'm glad it's wick, she cried out in a whisper. I want them all to be wick. Go around the garden and count how many wick ones there are. 
she quite planted uh, parents, and Dickon was as eager as she was. They were went from tree to tree. From Dickon carried his knife in his pocket and hand and showed her things which she thought wonderful. They've run wild, he said, but the strongest ones as fair thrived on it. The uh, dedicatedest ones has uh, ooh, the delicatest ones has died out. The others has growed and growed and spread and spread. All these wonder. See. And he pulled down a thick, gray, dry-looking branch. A body might think this was dead, but I don't believe it is. Down to the root. I'll cut it low down and see. He knelt and with his knife cut a lifeless-looking branch through. Not far above the air, he cried exultantly. I told thee so. There's green in that wood yet. Look at it. Down on her knees before he spoke, gazing with all her might. When it looks so... Uh, Bit and juicy like that, it's wick, he exclaimed. When the inside is dry and gray, like there's uh, this here piece I've cut off, it's done for. There's a big root of all his, this live wood sprung out of. And if the old woods and this dog round and took care of, uh, and took care of, there will be. And lifted his face to look up at the climbing and the hanging sprays above him. There are roses here this summer. He went from bush to bush, from tree to tree. He was clever with his knife and knew how to cut the dry and dead wood away and could tell a promising bough or twig with had still green life in it. In the course where Mary thought she could tell, too, and when he cut through a lifeless-looking branch, she would cry out joy breath when she caught sight of the least shade of moist green. The spread and hug and hoe and fork were very useful. He showed her how to use the fork while he dug about the roots and stirred, uh, stirred the earth and let the air in. They were working industriously round one of the biggest strand, uh, standard roses when he caught sight of something and uttered an exclamation of surprise. Why, he cried, pointing to the grass, eh? who did that? It was one of Mary's own little clearings round the pale green point. I did it, said Mary. Why, I thought that didn't know nothing about gardening, he exclaimed. I answered that they were so little, and the grass was so thick and strong, and they looked as if they had no room, so I made a place for them. I don't even know what they are. Dickon went and knelt, smiling his wide smile. That was right, he said. A gardener couldn't tell thee better. Told thee better. They'll grow now like Jack's beanstalk. The crocus no drops, and these here is narcissuses. Turning to uh, another, and here's Daffy Down Dillies. Hey, there will be a sight. He ran from one another. <clears throat> that has done a lot of work for such a little wench, he said, looking her. I'm growing fatter, said Mary, and I'm growing stronger. I used always to be tired. When I, no, when I dig and I'm not tired at all. I like to smell the earth when it's turned up. It's rare good for thee, he said, nodding his head wise, wisely. There's no the smell of good clean earth except the smell of fresh growing things when the rain falls. I get out on the moor many a day when it's raining and I lie under a bush until the soft swish of drops on the heather and I just sniff and sniff. My nose ends fair quivering like the rabbits, mother says. Do you never catch Gardner Mary gazing at him? She had never seen such a funny boy or such a nice. Not me, he said, grinning. I never catched cold since I was born. It's brought nice, uh, brought up nesh enough. I have chased about the moor weather the same as the rabbits does. Mother says I've always sniffed up too much fresh air for twelve years to get to sniffling with cold. I'm as tough as a white thorn knob stick all the time he was talking, and Mary was following him and helping him with her fork or trowel. Work to do here, he said once, looking about quite exultantly. Will you come again and help me to do it? She begged. I'm sure I can help too. I can dig and pull up the eaves, whatever you tell me. Oh, do come, Dickon. I'll come every day if thou wants me to shine, he answered stoutly. It's the best fun I ever had in my life. Shut and waken up a garden. If you will come, Mary said, if you will help me to make I don't know what I'll do, she ended helplessly. 
What could you do for a boy like that? I'll tell thee what thou'll do, said Dickon with his happy grin. Thou get fat and thou'll get on a young fox, and thou'll learn how to talk in the robin the same as I do. The robin the same as I do. Hey, we'll have a lot of fun. He began to walk about, looking up and at the well, walls and bushes with a thoughtful expression. I wouldn't want to make it gardener's garden, all clipping, uh, clipped and spick and span, would you? He said, nicer like this, with things running wild and swinging and catching hold of each other. Don't let us make it tidy, said Mary anxiously. It wouldn't seem like a secret garden tidy. Dickens stood rubbing his rusty red head with a rather puzzled look. It's a sure enough, he said, but seems like someone beside the robin must have been in it since it was ten years ago. But the door was locked and the key was buried, said Mary. No one could get it. That's true, he answered. It's a queer place. It seems to me if there's been a bit of pruning done later than ten years ago. Um, but how could it be? said Mary. He was examining a branch of a standard rose, and he shook his head. I have he muttered, with the door locked and the key buried. Mistress Mary always, for her many years she lived, she could never forget that first morning when her garden began to grow. First, it did seem to begin to grow for her that morning, when Dickon began to clear places to plant seeds. Basil had sung at her when she wanted to tease her. When he wanted to tease her, How many flowers that look like bells. She inquired, "Lilies of the valley does, sir." dripping away, uh, dipping away with the trowel. And there's candles and campanulas. Let's plant some, said Mary. The lily of the valley here already. I saw him. He'll be growing too close and we'll have to separate him. But there's the other ones takes two years to bloom from seed, but I can bring you some bits of plants for garden. Why dost thou want them? When Mary told him about Basil and his brothers and Sia, and how they had hated, uh, she had hated them, and of their calling her Mistress Contrary, they used to dance around and sing to me, uh, sing at me. They sang, Mistress Mary, how did your garden grow with silver bells and cockle shells and marigolds, marigolds all? I just remembered it and it made me wonder if there were really flowers like silver bells. I frowned a little and gave her uh, trowel a rather spiteful dig into the earth. I wasn't as contrary, but Dickon laughed. Eh, he said as he crumbled the rich black saw he was sniffing up the scent of it. There doesn't, there doesn't seem to be for no one to be contrary when there's flowers and such like, and such lots of friendly wild things making homes for themselves or building nests and singing and whistling does there. He looked by him holding the seeds, looking at him and stopping, frown, stopped frowning. You're as nice as Martha said you were. I like you and you make the fifth person. I never thought I should like five people. Dickon sat up on his heel as he did when she was polishing the grate. He did look funny and delightful. Mary thought of his round blue eyes and red cheeks and happy looking turned up nose. Only five folk of that like, he said. Who is the other four? Your mother and Martha? Mary checked them off on her finger. And the robin and Ben Weatherstaff. Dickon laughed so that he was obliged to stifle the sound armor over his mouth. I know that thinks I'm a queer lad, he said. But I think thou art the queerest little lad. When Mary did a strange thing, she leaned forward and asked him a question never dreamed of asking anyone before. And she tried to ask it uh, ask it in Yorkshire because she that was his language and in India and always pleased when you knew his speech. Does thou like me? she said. Hey, he sparkly. That I does. I likes thee wonderful. And so does the robin. I do. That's two then, said Mary. That's two for me. And then they began to work harder and, and more joyfully. Mary was startled and sorry when she heard the big clock in the courtyard strike the midday dinner. I shall have to go, she said mournfully. And you will have to go, Dickon grinned. My dinner's easy to carry about with me, he said. Mother always lets me get something in my pocket. He picked up his coat from the grass and brought out of the pocket a lump tied up in a quite clean, coarse 
blue and white handkerchief. It held two slices of bread, with a slice of something laid between them. Loving is not but bread, he said, but I've got a fine slice of fat bacon with it today. Mary thought it looked queer, but she seemed ready to enjoy it. Run on and get thy victuals, he said. I'll be done with my... I'll get some more work done before I start back home. He sat down with his back against a tree. I'll call the robin up, he said, and give him the rind of the bacon to peck at. They like wonderful. Mary could scarcely bear to leave him. Suddenly, it seemed to be a sort of wood fairy who might be gone when she came back to the garden again. He seemed too good to be true. She went slowly halfway to the door in the wall, and then she stopped and back. Whatever happens, you you never would tell, she said. Her cheeks were dis distended with his first big bite of bread and bacon, but he managed encouragingly. If that was a missile thrush and showed me what uh, it was, just I think I'd tell anyone, not me, he said. Thou art as safe as a missile thrush. And she was quite sure she was. At the end of the chapter, and we're going to stop there for the day. And we're almost happy we should be able to finish this book next week, which is cool. I need to get a new computer soon, so, you know, that should help with the choppiness of my stream. But I need what computer I need to get first. Anyways, thank you for joining. I'm going to end the stream, and then I'm going to post uh, somebody else. I think that uh, Sunflows is hosting, and he's pretty fun. Thanks. I'll see you next